Precious Master, Father who dwells up yonder. Our Lord, our God, and our Father, you have called us into this gracious meeting. That my Father, we come and learn from you about one of the greatest institutions that my Father, you instituted in the Garden of Eden, that is marriage. Lord God Almighty, we plead with you that allow your power to use your servant that at the end of all this, my Father, we shall, we shall say that surely your power and your majesty will sing and our children are blessed. Gracious Redeemer, my Father, come down. Lord God, take charge of all the activities at this place. Most so, my Father, allow me to present before your power the public address system. Lord God Almighty, this meeting is not ours, but it is yours. Use us and let everything be done in accordance to your holy will. In Jesus' name I pray. Jambo, Jambo. Jambo. Karibu. <laughs> We're delighted to be with you in Kisumu, Kenya, getting an opportunity to speak to all of Kenya. And um, we're going to be doing a series uh, called, as you know, Healthy Family Relationships. And so uh, tonight is our opening evening, and our first presentation is what everyone should know about communicating effectively. Well, we are very excited to be here with you and online on YouTube and Hope Channel Kenya, where we feel so much at home, we feel welcomed by all of you, and we look forward to spending this week with you. We always like to begin by introducing our family. We have two children. Um, they're online right now, so when you go back home, you can watch the program again, and you'll see a picture of our children. We have two children. Jessica is our firstborn, our daughter, and Jessica is a public health educator. She actually works at the world headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and she's getting married this year. So a few years ago, maybe about 10 years ago, when I came, first came to uh, Kenya, I uh, spoke for university students at the Kenyatta University in Nairobi and the Jomo Kenyatta University. Uh, they offered several cows for my daughter. But uh, apparently uh, there were not enough cows or she wasn't ready for marriage. She's getting married this year. I don't know. We, we need to get some cows from that young man. Yeah, we hope we can find somewhere to have them purchase some cows. We also have a son. And his name is Julian, and, and Julian is a civil and environmental engineer. And uh, they're both young adults, they uh, are on their own, and uh, we like it that way. <laughs> well, Jessica lives with us. Jessica does live with us. Until she gets Until married. Until she gets married. Julian lives in Washington, D.C., and, and he, uh, he works in the area as well. So uh, I don't know if women offer cows for men, but if they do, uh, we're, we're open to some cows for Julian. <laughs> Well, one of the things that we often say to people is that our family is like your family. We are not a perfect family. We are a family, though, that is committed to loving one another, to devoting and dedicating our lives, our family, our children, ourselves, our marriage to God. And through God's power, we are able to stand. We are able to remain a family that still likes each other. Not perfect, we don't always get along, but we're committed to communicating effectively. What we like to say is that uh, many times people get anxious and, uh, in their marriage because they're having some friction and they don't have a perfect marriage. We say to people, uh, don't worry too much about the fact that you don't have a perfect marriage. There's no perfect marriage because there are no perfect people. So they don't exist. But what we do want is a committed marriage. People who love each other, people who are trying to make the best of every situation, people who are trying to get along and learning how to get along. And we'll be talking about many of these uh, topics in this week. Tell them about tomorrow's topic. Well, tomorrow evening, we hope that you will come back, that you will continue to watch with us online. We will be talking about what everyone should know about how to love well. Now, one of the things that we love about our work is that we get to meet people who are always excited about being in love. And so we're going to talk a little bit tomorrow night about what true love is. 
and how do we really learn to love well. So please come back tomorrow. Please tune in tomorrow because we want to share with you what real love is. Since true love comes from God and only God really knows about love, we like to speak to God before we get started. So pray with us as we begin. Dear God, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for being with us, for blessing us, for your mercies which are new each and every day. And thank you for your promise to be with us. We pray for these families in a special way. Those in the auditorium here in Kisumu and those at home watching by television. Bless them in a special way. Bless their families and help them to get along. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the first things we'd like to begin talking to you about is communicating with each other, what that looks like. In the Bible, in the book of Colossians, chapter 4, at verse 6, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. And I'm reading from the New King James Version, and the Word of God says, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each other. Let your speech always be with grace. So when we talk about grace, what is grace? Anyone can tell me, what is grace? Anyone, what is grace? Unmerited favor, I'm hearing someone says. Say, that's exactly what grace is. Something that you don't deserve. Someone is giving you something you don't deserve. Well, the Bible says that when we communicate with each other, we need to have a speech that is filled with grace. Even if someone doesn't deserve to be spoken that way, because we've received the grace of God, we give grace as well. It says season with salt. How many of you like uh, food without salt? Just, just plain food. Uh, not, not many. I, I see no one um, raising their hands. And those of you at home watching by television, I don't see your hands either. No one likes to eat food that is not seasoned, that has no taste. So what the Bible is saying, as we are communicating with each other, we're talking about communicating effectively, that our speech needs to be seasoned with salt. In other words, it needs to taste good. When I speak to my wife, she needs to feel good about what I'm saying. When you speak to your husband, he needs to feel good about what you are saying. Those of us who are married, we know exactly what we're talking about. There are words between husband and wife, and certain words make you feel good. Other words make you feel not so good. Those are the words that don't come with salt. They come with something else, maybe vinegar or something bitter. Okay, but the Bible says when we speak, our speech needs to be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer one another. The Bible also says, let each of you look out not only for his own interests or her interests, but also for the interests of others. So we're talking about communicating with others. And if we are going to learn how to communicate effectively, we need to be more concerned about the other person. Now I know that's very difficult because we were all born in sin and shaped in iniquity, right? The Bible tells us that, so I'm not coming here to call you names or anything. That's what it says in the Word of God, that we're born in sin. And what that means is we come into this world in a very selfish way. Now, when we're babies, selfishness is okay because you're a baby, you're helpless. And so it's not really technically selfish, although that's what we term, call it, but at some point we grow up and we begin to learn that the world does not just exist to serve our needs. So what the Word of God is saying here is that if I am going to communicate well and effectively, I need to be concerned about the interests of the other person and less about myself. Now this is countercultural in all of our cultures. Now they've been saying all day that we've traveled the world. There are some places where we have not traveled, but we have been to all of the continents except for Antarctica. And what we found is that communication problems are the same everywhere. Doesn't matter what country, 
doesn't matter what state, doesn't matter what county, doesn't matter what tribe. Communication issues exist everywhere and they're pretty much the same for all of us. And at the root of our issues is selfishness, sin and selfishness. So what we want to share with you a few patterns that destroy relationships. And of course, these patterns are manifested in communication. So if you're going to communicate well, you need to be thinking about the other person. Now, most of us, when we're communicating, we want to communicate, and usually we raise our voice because we think we're right and the other person is wrong. I, I don't know how it is here in Kisumu. They tell me um, everybody's right. That would be a problem if everybody's right. Well, uh, usually the person who is speaking uh, thinks he is right or she is right. But anyway, there are patterns that we know based on scientific research that people communicate in this way. And we're going to talk to you about these four patterns. They destroy oneness. They destroy relationships. And those of you who are here, if, if you're married, you want to remain married. And not only do you want to remain married, you want to have a good marriage. Nobody gets married to have a fight. How many of you get married to have a fight? Nobody gets married to have a fight. Wait, I think I see, I think I see someone over here. You think? No? Oh, okay. okay. Just most, making sure. Most people get married because they say they love the other person. Because they say they are in love. Because they, they want to live their lives forever together. So, if this is what you want, then you want to avoid these patterns. And even in, in our relationships with our children, with our parents, with our in-laws, with our neighbors. These patterns, if we can eliminate these patterns that we're gonna talk about, you will find that your communication, your relationships will go much better. So the first pattern we wanna talk about is called escalation. Escalation, it is exactly as it says. Escalation is when we begin talking about something that's pretty basic, something maybe like the trash was not taken out. Or what we're having for, for lunch today. Or what we're gonna have for lunch today. <laughs> and someone says, well, can we have pasta? No, this is Kisumu, we don't have pasta here. <laughs> oh, but I think there's a little pasta shop somewhere around here that we can get some pasta. There's an American or an Italian person that brought some pasta. That's, that's for the tourists, you know, here we, we eat at home. Sukuma no, I pasta. want to have, I want to have pasta. Ah, uh, ah, ah, trouble, trouble. We have to call on the pasta so he can pray for us. So escalation is when, you notice we started very low. We, we, did, we didn't really escalate. Well, we but, could lie. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but there's a disagreement. And usually when we disagree, we begin to feel uncomfortable. Because as he said, each one of us believes that we are right. And so what we do is we raise our voices a little bit to prove that we're right. And then the other person says, well, if you could raise your voice, I could do better than that. I can raise my voice even louder. And before long, you're talking at a very loud decibel. I see people nodding their heads and maybe online as well. And then we've forgotten that what we're speaking about is pasta. And we start to say things like, you see, you're just like your father. You're just like your mother. You, you, you always think you're right. You think your family is always right. No, and your family, I don't like the way they treat me. Well, you see, you know, your family didn't even give a gift to my family during the wedding. We gave, we gave more than enough cows. No, 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 no. See, see, this is the We thing. negotiated. No, no, your family thinks they're right and they know nothing. Does this sound familiar? What are we arguing about? Did you hear any pasta in this last conversation? <laughs> and that's what escalation is. We've totally forgotten what the real topic is, and now we've dug up all of the old problems that we had maybe even buried and said we're sorry for, 
and now we're escalating and now it feels real badly. And what the experts say is that when we escalate, if we don't learn how to de-escalate, at some point, someone is going to want to leave the relationship. Now, I know that in many cultures around the world, including the United States, especially in Christianity, where people may not believe in divorce, they may stay married, but they're not married. They're living in the same house, but they're not intimate. They're sleeping in the same bed even, but they're not speaking to each other. That's a result of escalation. And what we need to learn how to do is to de-escalate. So, sweetheart, see, we start with a nice sound. <laughs> Sweet, salt, sugary. Sweetheart, caribe, caribe. I know. <laughs> I know that you want to have ugali and sukuma week. And I've made some for you. But I'm wondering if you would be willing to come to the pasta shop with me sometime. Well, I'll think about it, you know. Maybe one day this week we can, we can have pasta instead of ugali and sukuma week. So we both can be right. Can we learn to do that? We go back to the text, right? We need to communicate with grace. We need to be more interested in the interest of the other person. So if I know that what my husband loves is ugali, before I ask for pasta, I might want to comfort him. Now, some of the ladies are saying, why can't he comfort me? Well, that's true. And did you hear what he said? He said, maybe on Thursday. So we learn to be interested in the other person's interests first. And there's a saying that says, what goes around comes around. Sometimes we use it in a bad way, but it also works for the positive. Love begets love. So we can learn how to de-escalate. One of the things that we teach people to do is to just stop speaking. Not silent treatment, not stop speaking for the next year or two years, but just for the moment. Just allow yourself to calm down so that you're, you're not so excited and you can think clearly. Yes, and once we agree that we'll have pasta, when was it, Thursday? Thursday. Well, on Friday we could have ground nuts. And more ugali. And more ugali, yes. Go on to uh, pattern number two. All right, pattern number two is negative interpretations. And negative interpretations is a very, very uh, detrimental pattern that can really create significant problems in relationships. And what it is, is when I think of my relationship, of my spouse, or what they say more negatively than it really is. So I might think, oh, I just have a, a horrible relationship. My husband is a terrible man, and everything he says to me is negative. Everything? Everything. Everything, she says. That's negative interpretations. So if Say something to me. Say something to you. Yeah, you tell me something that, might, that I might interpret negatively. Okay. This is a for instance. It's, um, it's Sabbath morning, and we're getting ready for church. And I'm ready, and I'm waiting. And uh, she comes out of, of the bedroom, and she has on a, a pink dress. And I say, uh, you going to wear that? What's wrong with what I'm wearing? No, no, I, I, I didn't say anything was wrong. I, I'm just asking. What, what you don't like what I'm wearing? Well, well, no. See, you know, you're always like that. You're always negative. No, no, no. See, Every time I put something on, you look at me in a negative way and you have a negative comment to make. No, no, no. Let, let, see, I'm just tired of no, this. Let me, let me tell you what's going on here. See, last Wait, night, uh -huh. last night, we agreed that... I would wear my blue tie and you were going to wear your blue dress. 
But I have on my blue tie, and, and you have on a pink dress. So I was just wondering if you had forgotten. So I'm asking, are you going to wear this dress to church? <laughs> That's what it would look like if, I, if we allow him to speak. But most times we don't. We just get upset. Then we escalate. So you see, these patterns do not exist in isolation. They're not separate. They come together. I interpret what he said negatively. I'm going to give you these. I found it. <laughs> My glasses get fogged up. Okay. Okay. So I interpret what he says negatively and then I start to escalate because it has created some bad feelings inside of me. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Or you don't have that problem here in Kisumu? Yeah, They're, these are universal issues. Why? Because we're from the human race. And our issues are pretty much the same everywhere. And it's these same negative patterns that are destroying our marriages and destroying our families. And we need to learn to remove them from our relationships. One of the ways to get rid of negative interpretation is to think positively. What we call it is a, is a positive override. So when he says to me, Are you going to wear that today? Yes. Did you like this? I, I liked this dress. I, I think it looks very nice on you. It's just, it's just that last night we agreed that we would wear blue. Tea. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry, sweetheart. So. Would you be willing to change your tie or do you want me to change my dress? You know what? It's easier if I change my tie. So let me go get a pink tie. <laughs> We're not making this up because I know somebody is saying that's not possible. It seems so fake. Do we believe the word of God? Yes. Did we not read a text that said everyone, who? Everyone should be more concerned about the interests of the other person. So is God for real? Then we need to go and do likewise. He's the creator. He created us. He knows what capacity we have. And we have the capacity to remove a negative interpretation from our relationship. And what we want to share with you is that it doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. We said at the beginning, we're not perfect. So sometimes a negative interpretation enters, but we try to correct it because we say, oh, that's right. We need to change the way we're thinking about this statement. I need to change the way I'm thinking about this statement. And I need to make an effort to give my spouse the benefit of the doubt. That's what we usually say. Elaine and I agreed a long time ago that we would never hurt each other on purpose. But we're human beings. And because we're human beings and we're not perfect, we might say something or do something that hurts the other person. Does that happen in Kisu? It happens in Kenya, right? You're part of the human race. It happens everywhere, you know? But we have agreed, and this is an agreement that we've had for many years. That's why we're still married, 33 years, that we will never hurt each other on purpose. So sometimes, you know, I, I'm speaking, I'm, I'm, I'm telling Elaine something, and because of what I say, she feels hurt. I didn't mean to hurt her, but she feels hurt. But she knows I didn't mean to hurt her on purpose. So what do you do when you have agreed not to hurt each other on purpose, but you feel hurt? What do you do? You give your spouse the benefit of the doubt. What else and do you do when you are hurt? I'll give you an example. If you step into a lift, that's what you guys call the elevator here? A lift? Okay. And you step on someone's toes, the person usually says what? Sorry, sorry, right? <laughs> okay. And oh, but before you say that, the person usually says, ouch. Right? In marriage, we are always saying ouch. We have different ways of saying ouch. If you say something to your spouse,
that hurt him, that hurt her, he might say something or she might say something like this. What would you say if I say something that hurt you? I, I didn't like the way you said that about my dress. See? She's saying, ouch. Are, are you with me? There are many ways of saying, ouch. And you need to tune in to what your spouse is saying. So, I didn't mean to hurt her, but I said something to her that hurt her. And so she's hurt, and you say, ouch. Ouch. So when someone says, ouch, what do you say? Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Absolutely. And you see how quickly they said sorry. Yes. How is it that we are able to say sorry to people we don't know? But to people we love and are married to, we just get upset. We say, ah, oh, oh, you, you're too sensitive. That, 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 that shouldn't hurt you. Oh. Why are you hurt? Or you can say something like, ah, see, my mother told me not to marry anyone from El Doret. <laughs> I should have found someone from Huebuye. <laughs> you know? And, and more hurt instead of apologizing. People, it really is not that difficult. You say something, you didn't mean to hurt your, your mate, you didn't mean anything by it, but you hurt her. If she says, that hurt, you say, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you, but you have to have the agreement. Elaine and I have an agreement, and sometimes we do say things that hurt the other person. They didn't mean it, but it happens because we're human beings. Or we do something, like what? So we agreed we'll have dinner at 6 p.m. this evening, and it's now 6.30, and I'm not home. This is Africa. This is Africa? Yes. What does that mean? It means that if it's 6.30 and you're not home, I don't know. I'm looking I at should be a little women. patient. If they, they expect you to be home at 6.30. They want you to be home at 6.30. I don't know. Yes? Or you could come home at 7 or at 8 or 9. Does it make a difference? Does it make a difference? It no. It doesn't make a difference. No, so you need a different example. Okay. So, wrong place. <laughs> That's Germany. That's Germany. Yeah. Ah, oh, yeah, the Germany. Yeah, when they say 12, they mean 12. Do you see? <laughs> Let me tell you what I mean by that. See, if you're in church in Germany and, and, and you just got up to preach at a quarter to 12 and uh, you have a sermon that's going to go for 45 minutes, you better end at 12 because after 12, there's nobody sitting in front of you. <laughs> you may have more sermon, but you'll be preaching to yourself. So, okay. So give me another example. Well, we spoke about the dress. Yes. And I think that's a good example okay. of saying the wrong thing. Right. So what I thought you were going to say is I thought you were going to say to all the gentlemen that even though you may not mean anything negative when you say to your spouse, are you going to wear that? It's probably a good idea not to say that, right? When you see your spouse, you should say, Darling, so what's a, what's a, uh, an endearment, an endearment yeah. that you might use here? What do you say? What do you say? Darling. Darling, 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 you look beautiful this morning. That's a good way to cut down on negative interpretations. But if your spouse doesn't do that, ladies, give him the benefit of the doubt. And what that means is, I am going to assume that he didn't mean to hurt me on purpose. Understand? I may feel hurt, but I'm going to assume that he didn't mean to hurt me on purpose. Now, because I've been thinking in this negative way for a long time, there's going to be a little voice saying, he did that on purpose. But I am going to say to myself, I am going to assume that my spouse did not mean to do that on purpose. So we have the capacity to take a different path in our brains. Just like as if you were walking out here and there was a roadblock, what would you do? You would go a different path. So these patterns are roadblocks to healthy relationships, to communicating effectively.
And what we want to do is we want to avoid them. We want to challenge ourselves to take a, a different path. It would be foolish for you to drive down a road where you see there's a big hole. Would you go down that road? Why? Why? Because it's ridiculous. Why? Because your car is going to get ruined. Again, we need to value our relationships much higher than we do our cars, our other personal belongings, even the stranger in the lift. So we can eliminate some of these patterns. Another negative pattern that we have is Invalidation. And invalidation is when you put your spouse down, either on purpose or maybe not so on purpose. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Because sometimes we don't understand how it works. For example, you get home and your wife comes in and she says, Oh, I'm so tired. I had a very rough day. And you say, I'm tired too. Does that happen here? That's invalidation. What do you mean? Invalidation. Pasta. What do you mean? Invalidation. Well, like this. If your wife comes home and she says, I'm tired, what do you think she is expecting from you? Say? I didn't hear. Oh, I, sympathy. I'm, sympathy. Empathy. Empathy. You know, concern. If she says, if you say, say it. Oh, I'm so tired. Oh, sweetheart. I'm so sorry. Uh, let, let me rub your feet. <laughs> I, I think you need to start small. <laughs> small. Yeah, just just a pat on the back, just maybe. A pat on the back. <laughs> I, I, I want to take you from zero to a hundred. <laughs> let's 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 start with with some small baby steps here. Baby steps. Yes. Huh? Okay. Yes. Say something nice, like, "Oh, I'm so sorry you've had such a difficult day. Can I do something to make your day better?" Did you hear that? Can I do something to make your day better? Better. Yeah. yeah. So. And you know what I want to add to that is that what we hear from many people around the world, again, is that with women getting more educated, and it's not just here in Africa. This is an issue, while it's taking a little longer for this to come to the continent of Africa and to many of your countries, We've had the same issues in many countries of the world where women used to stay home, do all the housework, take care of the children, and now women are getting educated. And what does that mean? It means that they're coming into the workforce. What does that mean? It means that now they have what we call the second shift. They go out and work, outside, then they come, come home and work. Ugali, and, and what we hear, what we hear from men is that our wives are becoming like the women in the West. And they, they, they don't want to cook anymore. Gentlemen, it's not that your wives don't want to cook, right, women? But if she comes home, or you come home, let's say she's still working at home and not working outside, either way, and she says, oh, I am so tired. Oh, maybe I should make this ugali and sukuma week today. I know that's hard for you. Well, but I would even dare say, if you, gentlemen, said, sweetheart, I hear you, darling, I hear you say you're tired. Women, do you think you would feel a little more empowered to go make that ugali and sukuma week? Yes. Some of you are saying no. But most of us, if we feel validated, it's a lot easier for us to be cheerful about our work, to do the things that maybe we would rather not do, but we could still do it. Or, like you said, the man could say, um, let me try to cook today. That may be a bad day, but try, you know. Maybe we'll go eat pasta today. <laughs> I've spoken to many African men who say they cook, you know. They say the culture doesn't like it, but they like it, so. All right, we are not trying to change your culture. 
what we're sharing with you are principles from the Word of God. We're not saying that women need to stop cooking and men need to start cooking. What we're saying is each one, everyone, needs to care more about the interests of the other person. That's biblical. It's not Western. It's not from the US. It's not from Europe. It's not from Asia. It's in the word of God. Everyone should be interested first in the other one's interest. So when we invalidate one another, when we put each other down, oh, you're so, this is another way of invalidation. You can't even do anything right. What do you mean I can't you, do anything You, you right? don't know what you're doing. Every time I ask you to do something, you get it wrong. Well, well, you get it wrong too. You see, this is what happens. You start invalidating and pretty soon you start escalating because you start fighting with each other. What do you mean I don't do anything right? I married you, right? <laughs> what are you going to say about that? <laughs> so we need to remove invalidation. And the last pattern we want to look at is called withdrawal and avoidance. And basically, this is a pattern that takes place because many of these other patterns are present in the relationship. We've just gotten to the place where we just withdraw. Remember we said some couples remain married, they live in the same house, maybe even sleep in the same bed, but they've withdrawn from each other emotionally and even physically, because what we do know is that many people are not even living with their spouses because of many of the tensions and the baggage that exists in their relationship. So we want to not withdraw, we want to confront in a nice way the problems that we're dealing with in our relationship. And if we're willing to remove these patterns like escalation, what we do is we create a safe place for us to feel that we can talk with one another safely. There's much more about communicating effectively and one of the main principles is listen first and talk second. It's very simple, but listen to it. Listen first, talk second. Most times people can't speak well because they want to talk first, and they want to talk second, and they want to talk, talk third and fourth, and they're still talking. Do you know people like that? Don't, don't, don't volunteer. If you're, if you're sitting next to your spouse and you think it's your spouse, don't, don't volunteer, okay? But the truth is, most people who don't communicate effectively are only thinking about themselves, what they have to say, not what the other person has to say, what they have to say. Remember the passage of scripture, everyone should look out for the interests of others. An American poet, I forget his name now, once said, no one learn anything new while speaking. Think about it. No one learns anything new while speaking. While you're speaking, you're talking about what you already know. If you want to learn something new, you need to listen to somebody else. Perhaps your spouse, who may be telling you something that happened with the children that day that you don't know. If you don't listen first, you won't learn, you won't grow. The relationship won't grow. Now, there's something else I want to say about this, communicating effectively, and that is, notice how God creates humans with intention with strategic planning in mind. He gives us two ears and he gives us one mouth so we can listen twice as much as we speak. The problem is that often what happens is we speak twice as much as we listen. So, one of the important principles in communicating effectively is listen first, talk second. You know, my preference is to talk first. Is that your issue too? My, my preference is to talk first. I, 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 naturally, I want to talk first. But we can all learn how to listen first. That is something we can decide on. Just like we decide to follow Jesus, we can decide to change the way we speak with each other. When you come home, instead of saying, hey, guess what happened at work? You can ask your spouse, hey, sweetheart, what, what happened to you today? How was your day? Ask the question, how was your day? You're inviting the other person to speak. People want to be in the presence of people who are interested in listening to them. 
And if you're married to a woman, that means you're a man. If you're married to a woman, that means you're a man, right? Women like to speak. Do women like to speak in Kisumu? Yes. In Kenya? Yes. Women like to speak in Tanzania, in South Africa. They like to speak in the United States, in, 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 in the UK, in, in, in Japan. Everywhere we go, women like to speak. In fact, women have twice as many words in the day than men do. They like to speak. Well, men, if you were married to a woman, then you need to learn how to listen. Because they like to speak. So, we always say ladies first. So, gentlemen, when you get home, ask your wife to speak. Speak, sweetheart. <laughs> and after she speaks and she tells you something, you can ask, is there anything else you would like to say? <laughs> That's a gift. That's a gift. You have no idea what your marriage could be like if you just say to your spouse, your wife, speak, sweetie. What's on your mind? And then she speaks for about 10 minutes, and then you ask, is there anything else you'd like to say? <laughs> Gentlemen, that's a gift. That's a gift. If you give your wife that gift, you will have a happy marriage. Because women love to speak. My wife loves to speak. And I've learned to love to listen. So remember, to communicate effectively. Listen first, talk second. Now, now we, we've used it in the context of marriage, but I always want to um, add that these principles work for all of our relationships. So whether you're married or not, if you're a parent, it works well. Even our small children have things they want to share with you. It's not about having them be disrespectful or rude, but we can learn to listen to what's ha what they have to say, and they have things that they would like to say. And we can teach them how to speak in a way that is respectful. But we want to listen to our children. We want to listen to our teenagers. We want to listen to our next door neighbor that maybe, you know, maybe their cow is grazing in your yard. Maybe the neighbor left some trash in your yard. Maybe if we listened, we would hear something and we would be better able to communicate with them. So listening first, talking second, is a powerful tool in communicating effectively. It's very hard for all of us, not just women, but men as well, because it goes back to what we said at the beginning, that we are all pretty much selfish human beings. And most times, we're more interested in ourselves than we are about the other person. And we're not saying that we are any different. It's the nature of, human, of humanity. But we can learn how to do things in the way God created us to do them. We just have to retrain ourselves. So no, we're talking about communicating effectively and we're talking about communicating among ourselves. But the truth is, if we're gonna communicate effectively, we need to communicate with God. We need to know how to communicate with God. And here we find in the Bible, in the book of Matthew, chapter six and verse six, it's about talking to God. It says, but you, when you pray, go into your room and when you have shut your door, Pray to your father who is in, in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. We're talking about speaking to God. We want to speak effectively in our families. That's a good thing. But we also want to speak with God. Because if we speak with God, then we have the patience to speak more effectively with one another. What else does the Bible have to say? Eli? The Bible also says to talk to God often. Pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. We will be unable to really communicate effectively if we don't learn to talk to God and communicate with God. When we talk to God, we have a better understanding of who he is. And the more we talk to him, the more we understand who he is. And the Bible tells us that God is love. We're going to talk more about that tomorrow, about what this true love is. Also, we need to listen to God. In the book of John, chapter 5, 39, the Bible says, you search the scriptures, 
For in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. We're talking about communication here, but to communicate, we need to communicate with God. Not only do we pray, but we also listen to the word of God. Because in the word of God is the message of God for us, because he loves us. God's word, the Bible, is his love letter to us. In his love letter, he tells us how to live. In his love letter, he tells us how to be. In his love letter, he tells us what to do and what not to do so we can have the best life possible. So, if we're going to communicate well, we need to have God in our lives. Some more about communicating with God. In the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3 and verse 16, for people who might be wondering, the voice of God, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. If we're going to live right, if we're going to do what is right, we need to believe the word of God. We need to communicate with God as he is communicating with us, as he is communicating with us in 2 Timothy 3.16. One other text we'd like to use as, as, as we try to wrap up and bring this to our conclusion this evening, and that's the movement of God. For prophecy, the Bible tells us in 2 Peter 1.21, for prophecy never came by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So people are saying, how do we know what's in the Bible is true? We know what's in the Bible is true because the Bible was not written just out of thin air. The Bible was written through the inspiration of God. So as we are speaking about communication, we're speaking about being effective with one another, but we're also speaking of be, about being effective in our communication with God. And to be effective in our communication with God, we need to read the Word of God. So the question tonight is, who believes the Word of God? Who believes the Word of God? Who believes the Word of God? If we're going to communicate well, we need to believe the Word of God. And so... The bottom line of today's, tonight's teaching is we must believe, but not only believe, we must obey the word of God to enjoy the peace he wants to give us in our relationships. It's not enough for us to say we believe in the word of God. If we believe, then we have to obey. And when we obey, when we obey, we are going to find peace, joy, happiness, grace. We'll be able to communicate effectively in our relationships. God will give you what you need to communicate effectively, even if you've done it wrong for the last 50, 60, 70 years of your life. If you believe and obey, you will receive that peace. And that's what it means to be at one with God. That's what it means to be a child of God. That's what it means to walk with God. Now, this is not so easy. And we spoke to you about a number of things perhaps you heard for the first time. Is it easy to listen first and talk second? Perhaps not. We would rather speak instead of listening. But here's what we do know. There is a promise of success. We find it in the book of Philippians 4 and verse 13. You know what it says. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You want a good marriage? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You want to speak well? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You want to be closer to God? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the good hope of tonight's message. That's the good hope that to communicate effectively, we need to pay attention. We need to uh, always speak with grace and our language seasoned with salt so that we may speak correctly to one another. We should look out for one another's interests, the other person's interests, not only our own, but that's not easy, but we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. We can do all things through Christ who give us strength. Who believes that with God's grace you can communicate more effectively with your spouse, with your children, with your friends, with your grandparents, with your parents, with your neighbors? Who believes that this is possible? It is possible because with God all things are possible and I can do all things through Christ who gives us strength we can do so. We're going to pray with you. And as we pray, 
we want to remind you of tomorrow's topic. What is tomorrow's topic, Elaine? Tell them to come out on this. What everyone should know about how to love well. So come and find out what true love really is. And if you're watching, tune in again. I hear it's at 5 o'clock, 5 to 7, or something like that. I believe that's what they say. It's going to be on your screens. And if you're here and didn't bring a friend, bring a friend tomorrow. You don't want to take this all by yourself. You want to share it with someone else. So tomorrow evening, what everyone should know about how to love well. We're going to pray with you now before the choir sings. Dear God, thank you for giving us the power through you, through Jesus Christ, to be able to communicate effectively. Thank you, Father, for those who came tonight. And thank you for those who listen from home on their television sets. Bless them to communicate better, to think about it. Listen first, talk second, and remember that with God all things are possible and what? With God all things are possible. Yes, indeed. And we pray that for each person this evening who's here and who's listening in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you.